Hi guys, so today we're going to be looking at how to maybe size these cheap Chinese servo motors to say a CNC application and we're going to be talking about maybe the things that you need to consider when using a motor of this type. So to understand some of the considerations we need to actually look at when sizing, say, a servo motor and a servo drive to your application, we need to take a step back and quickly consider how the servo drive is controlling a servo motor. So if we have our armature, at the back of that, we normally can find an encoder. And this whole thing makes up your servo motor and on this side let's put some load. Your servo drive sits over here and it applies a certain voltage and a certain current. So your voltage over here which is applied is proportional to your velocity or you know your RPM and then your actual current is proportional to your torque Essentially, you have a feedback which comes back over here and that tells the actual servo drive where the current position is. What the actual servo drive does is it looks at the current position, it knows its target position and it varies the voltage and the current accordingly. So for example, you might start off when which, let's say this is the armature, so you're actually looking at the armature and you want the armature to maybe go to 2 o'clock over here. You might start off over here at 12 o'clock and you're far away from your desired position. But as you come closer and closer and closer, your voltage and your current is reduced accordingly to actually get to your say desired position. So in this instance, I'm just going to talk about getting to a desired position, but equally you can actually maybe have a desired velocity or a desired current or a desired torque, for example. But when you actually look at, say, a graph, one which you have position at the top over here, what you do want is you want a response like this. Actually, what you might find, though, is you might get an overshoot. You might get an overshoot and an undershoot. And this overshoot and undershoot, or your response, is really governed by, say, your load and then the feedback that's actually happening in the drive. So what do I mean by that? Well, say if you're over here, your actual servo drive might apply a certain voltage and a current to get closer to your actual target velocity. But the voltage and current it produces in accordance to how far it's off is governed by the gain settings. So this is how the actual loops inside the drive are configured. The higher the great gain, the more aggressive it's actually going to apply a voltage and current to get there. And if you have a higher load, that might well be the right thing to do. But if you have a lower load or a smaller load on this side, you may well have to reduce the gain settings to actually get to your desired position rather than overshoot or in turn undershoot. So gain settings are important, but with a Chinese servo driver or a servo driver where in which you don't have access to tune those gain settings very well, that becomes a bit of a problem because you can't really understand, say, the dynamic response. For you to understand it, you really need to look at what the encoder is doing. That's possible, but it's a little bit more involved. So we need to actually consider maybe some of the considerations when actually sizing them up. And two ways we can do that, or two rough ways that we can quickly look at, are inertia ratio and considering some of the coupling. So some of the coupling between your motor and everything that sits on the load side. So we spoke briefly about, say, inertia ratio and coupling, but what does that all mean? Well, effectively, our servo motor has inertia associated with it. That's the inertia of the rotor. So that can be represented as JM. Um, we also have, say, the inertia of the coupling, the ball screw, and the load. And then in turn, the inertia ratio is the load plus the screw plus the coupling over, say, the inertia of the motor. The torque requirements of driving this system over here is governed by this equation which is torque so that should be a t equals the total inertia 
determined by the angular acceleration. And the total inertia comprises of both the J-load, which um, plus the J-S plus the J-coupling. So that is that side of the system, plus the J-M. So if this over here goes up, and then this all remains the same, then effectively a torque requirement goes up. We may find that actually when JM goes up and we use a bigger motor, we have a whole heap of torque to actually, we have a whole, we have a lot more torque. However, obviously that's wasted. I mean, you know, we have to use all the energy up to accelerate this rotor. So there's not, a, it's not preferential to actually get this inertia ratio as small as possible. However, it's preferential to have a balance between say, you know, a system in which you have the load and that your rotor inertia somewhat match. So in my instance, um, I've actually kept the ratio to about one to one. Um, it's quite a it's quite a low ratio, but it also maximizes the chances of me actually controlling my servos. So I can show you some of the quick calcs to go into that. But before we actually do that, I want to speak about this flexible coupling over here. So this flexible coupling and this system over here can actually be modeled as a system with inherent springiness. So we'll just represent that as J load for now. But the actual coupling itself, so say if you're using a coupling like this, will have a wind and an unwind. So as you spin this coupling over here and in turn spin your load, the reflected inertia when you're trying to deaccelerate is going to wind and unwind this coupling and when you accelerate it too. And that in turn will affect the position of this side of your system, your servo side. Your encoder may well come close to where it wants to be and then suddenly this load is deaccelerating at a slightly different rate and then it will spring back and then in turn you'll get a resonance effect and these two may well be slightly out of phase. So to actually combat that it's preferential to have a stiff system. Modern servo drivers they can accommodate for certain things like this by using more advanced control algorithms but when you're using a basic servo motor or a basic servo drive you don't have access to those so the best combat you have is actually to increase say the stiffness between the coupling between the servo motor and actual system and when I mean stiffness I mean everything I mean the coupling I mean you know the housing the stages everything that rigidly couples that motor to everything on this side. It's preferential to increase that. And I'll show you some of the couplings that I'm using and maybe some of the benefits they have over using something like this. So if we're gonna go into the math quickly, um, I'll probably put some links below, but um, effectively we can actually represent, say, we can represent the total load or the total inertia of the system by J load plus JS plus J coupling and then we can JM. So we just spoke about that just a second ago. And the J load over here, so that over there, can be represented as the mass of the load, the pitch of your ball screw or your lead screw that you're actually trying to use. Okay, and then your JS I've modified, I've just kept that as, say, the inertia of a solid shaft. So I've approximated it as that. And the J coupling in my instance, I'm going to say it's negligible. So we're just going to neglect that. Um, it's quite small in comparison to everything else. So I'm going to neglect that for now. And the JM is typically given in your motor data sheet. So for my application, it's a 3.7 times 10 to the minus 4 kilograms per meter squared. So that's the inertia of my one kilowatt servo driver. So what you really want to be doing is you want to firstly work out your inertia ratio. So for mine, a comment about this is the pitch of your actual ball screw affects say, the load that you see. So for example, if you have 120 kilograms on your actual stages, and then you, you drive it with a pitch of say five millimeters, if you drive it with a pitch of say a millimeter, you actually will find that your inertia goes down quite significantly because of the squared on the actual turn. Um, 
The same is when you use a gearbox. So if you were to use a gearbox, you'll probably find that that was an easy fix to some of the inertia problems that you may all have. By maybe including a gearbox that's only got a ratio of 1 to 2, you might be able to reduce your inertia ratio by four times, simply because of the way the equations work. So um, that is a fix, but obviously that comes across with other caveats and problems, such as reduced top end speed, and then maybe some backlash in your system. So if you were to actually run through these calculations, for me, very quickly, I have a 180 kilogram stage altogether. So that is 120 kilograms for my bed, and then potentially 60 kilograms on my workpiece. So I think that works out to be that. So I've worked out before. And then what I've done is I've got this calculation. So I've got a 3.59 kilogram ball screw, or well that's an estimate of what it should be. And it's 25 mil in diameter, and then that's over eight squared. So that's 2.8 minus four. So that's kilograms per meter squared. And then my inertia ratio, uh, so my inertia of my rotor, we've already worked that one out. So the actual ratio itself is 1.1399, 10 to the minus 4, plus 2.804, 10 to the minus 4, over 3.7, 10 to the minus 4. And that, in my instance, works out to be, like I said, about 1. So, you may have applications that are a bit different to mine. I've kept that because of, like I mentioned, the control loops and whatnot. Um, you might want to work out the peak torque. So, the peak torque can be worked out by understanding that the torque requirements are the torque to accelerate, say, the load and actually the motor itself, plus, say, the torque due to friction, plus, say, torque due to gravity, which may well be the case that if you have a stage, which is your z-axis, you might well want to control that, and then you have to overcome gravity itself. So in my application, I don't have that. I'm going to neglect friction for now, so we're going to just do a basic calculation on just this. So we can work out the torque due to that by um, using this relationship. So it's going to be the total total inertia times it by the angular acceleration. The angular acceleration in my case is simply modeled as two pi uh, a. So a is basically my linear acceleration and that's over the pitch of the actual ball screw itself. So I'll put some links down below of these calculations. I'm running them really fast because just to give you an idea of what to do. So in my case, I want my stages when I designed it to accelerate at 1G, so that's 9.81, and then the pitch for my ball screws is five millimeters. So that leads to a total angular acceleration of, of that. So what we need to do then is we need to work out the total peak torque, which in my application would be the total inertia, so that is effectively that, plus that, plus that, which works out to be 7.6439 times 10 to the minus 4, times it by 3924 pi. And then that gives me a total peak torque of 9.4 newton meters. So that's basically the torque or the peak torque I need to accelerate my stages, which in this instance are 180 kilos in total, plus the screw, plus the actual inertia of the motor at 1G. So the peak torque on my servo motors, the, tw the one kilowatt servo motor I'm using to drive my x-axis is 12 newton meters. So I think that's rated for one second. I think in reality, I'm probably not gonna be coming close to that acceleration. Um, I'm probably never gonna have 180 kilograms on it as well. So I should probably, that, that figure there should be a bit lower, but then I haven't taken into account the frictional effects, which will bump that up again. So that's maybe a quick example calculation of maybe something that you do. But I put a link down below because I've gone through that quite quickly and um, it's something to bear in mind when you're actually maybe sizing up. So I thought I'd probably quickly just take this apart and then show you the couplings that I'm using. 
But uh, just to comment that moment, this is really a temporary stage. So the way that I've actually mounted this to actually my stage may well not be the stiffest method. However, I want to change that in the future. On my Y axis, I might show you that in a bit. I've done a better job of actually coupling the two. So that's a little bit more, st the structure is inherently more stiffer than say this structure over here. But anyway, I'll go ahead and take that apart. Um, and then I'll show you the coupling that's inside it. So you can see the type of coupling that I actually have on this server motor and you can probably see how it differs. So your typical coupling probably looks like that and you can probably imagine that actually having that inherent structure means that you've got quite a bit of springiness between say one side of your input shaft and your output shaft. You obviously have the flexibility and this coupling performs its function in terms of stopping misalignment, so angular misalignment. However, what you probably will find is this is probably not as stiff as say other couplings. You may typically also find coupling like that. These are, I think they are called spider couplings of some sort. Um, and then you've got basically a compliant feature in here that gives you the, 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 couple, the compliance between this side and this side. So, you know, again, angular misalignment between the two. But um, with both of these options, there's an inherent stiffness associated with them. There is obviously a stiffness associated with this, but Couplings like this are typically a lot more stiffer than, say, the two that I just spoke about. So, with something like this, I'm not going to take it off its shaft because it's an absolute pain to actually set correctly again. If I zoom in for you... It's comprised of three segments. And then over here, these are effectively sheet metals. So, one part of the sheet metal is riveted to this segment over here and then in turn the next part of the sheet metal is riveted to this sec section over here. So in terms of torsional stiffness you have the fact that you have compliance, angular compliance, so you can actually move this coupling like this but you can see that actually that plate there is bolted to there or riveted to there and then bolted over here. So you've got a system that is slightly stiffer than say a coupling like this or like this. So this is my y-axis setup. Um, I think this setup is a little stiffer than the one I showed you but like I said uh, the x-axis I'm planning on casting that and changing that setup anyway. Um, so at the moment I've got a mild steel outer sleeve and then I've got this mill piece of aluminium and effectively there are six bolts that run through this and this which in turn are thread this, this section over here is threaded so these bolts go in and then screw into this section and that clamps this and this all to that and then I've got the same disc coupling in there than the one I just showed you so um, I think this setup is slightly stiffer um, yeah and then inside here I've got two angular contact bearings and then a nut that preloads it all together so that helps that controls the bore screw and the other end is um, effectively free to float so it's allowed to thermally grow. Um, yeah let me know if you found the video useful. Um, I can imagine I've oversimplified quite a few things but maybe the, some of the calculations um, maybe get you on your way and maybe some of the considerations I speak about will maximize success in your application.